sorry, there is no sound. Now there's sound. How's, how's this? Everyone, can you hear me now? I forgot to hit the mic button. It always happens when I'm live. So we are live. It is. Sorry, there is no sound. Oh. Now there's sound. How's, how's this? Let me just. Everyone, can you hear me now? Oh my God. I forgot to hit the mic button. Okay. Let me undo this. Okay. So, all right. You guys can hear me. Perfect. So we are live on Facebook, YouTube, in Vimeo for my webinar. We have a bunch of people in today. Thank you so much for joining me on this webinar for the Praxis Teaching Reading 5205. This is a test that I know a lot about because I've written several books about this. We've done lots of videos on this and I've got a lot of information for you to go through this this morning. So I'm so glad you're here with me today. If you are live on social media and not actually in the webinar, there is a link inside the description and for the videos and you can get the um you can get the study guide that we're going to be using today so this particular um webinar comes with a free study guide we do have more resources for this particular um, test, but today we're going to be working from the free study guide that came with this. There's 15 questions in the free study guide, and I have a presentation I'm going to be doing today, which I will give you in the follow-up email. So, so just some quick housekeeping before we get started. If you joined this webinar through the sign-up link, again, that's in the description if you're seeing this on social media. If you are actually in the webinar with me today, Welcome. Thank you for joining me. But also you're going to get a follow-up email when this whole webinar is over and you are going to be able to download everything we talked about today. The replay links, you can play it later and there's going to be a discount code in there. If you are in the webinar right now, I have a colleague. Her name, her name is Tess. She'll be answering questions inside the webinar because we have about a hundred people in here right now. And so it's hard for me to answer and do the the presentation. So she's going to be answering your questions. She will also share the link and the discount code to get that um, study guide for a discount if you're inside the webinar. Now, if you're interested in getting the study guide as, as a discount and you're watching me on social media, just click the link in the description where it says to sign up for the webinar. Once you do, you'll get on the email list and you'll be able to get all that stuff. Remember, some of our emails go to spam if you have your email preferences done a certain way. So if you don't see the email right away, check your spam or promotions folder and um, drag that email into your main inbox so you don't miss out on any information, all right? So we are doing Praxis Teaching Reading 5205. We have a book for this, a, a full-length study guide with tons of information. Today, we are going to be working from the free study guide, but if you're interested in this, I'm just going to show you really quickly where you can get it. So on my website, you can see here we have the teaching reading 5205 and you can also get the physical copy on Amazon. When you order from our website, you are ordering the digital copy. But if you prefer a physical copy, just hop on over to Amazon and let me show you here. This is where you will see the book. You can see we have lots of five-star reviews for this book and you can purchase it on Amazon as well. Now, Again, you're going to get an email from me with all the links and the follow-ups and things like that. So that works. Now, I see some people in the chat asking about um, the STAR, S-T-R in Texas, and the 090 or the 190 Pearson Foundations of Reading. All of these reading exams are so similar. So if you're in here because you are taking the Pearson exam or you're taking the Texas exam, everything that I'm talking about here is going to help you. I've studied the specs for all of these reading exams across the country. They all assess the same thing. Okay. So just keep that in mind. When I know people are very focused on their own exam, but what these exams do is they're teaching or they're, they're assessing the foundational skills of reading and they're teaching whether or not you understand the science of teaching reading. And that's what I really want you to focus on with this. The science of teaching reading is very, very important in elementary school and middle and high school. It's important all the way around. And so in some states, 
they are making their content area teachers, like their social studies teachers, their science teachers, their you know content area, non-reading teachers, um, they're requiring them to take this test because when they take this exam, they are basically certified in, in, in reading. Right. So, you know, that's not really what's happening. A test does not really give you the full, you know, information on how to teach reading, but it does check a box for the state and they can say, all of our teachers are certified in reading when really you guys just took a test, which is fine. That's great. I'm glad you're taking the test whatever, but really there's a lot more to it. And I get this question from people who say, um, well, I'm a science teacher and I don't understand this reading teaching. Like it's, it's beyond me. I'm a very linear thinker. I'm, I'm a math teacher or I'm a science teacher. But if you can think of teaching reading as a science, it's going to help you. There is a progression of steps, just like there are when you acquire math skills, when you acquire any skills, it's the same thing. It's just that reading comprehension is so abstract that we forget that there is a systematic explicit approach to teaching this. And in fact, the words systematic and explicit are good words on this exam that you want to think about. And let me just give you some background on that. So when we think of phonics instruction and reading instruction, for a while there, there was some research that pushed us towards a whole language approach, which means that students kind of learned this as they were learning to read and they kind of just figured out the phonics implicitly, meaning not explicitly taught. And so we got away from this systematic phonics instruction where we're talking about the silent E, where we're talking about diphthongs, where we're talking about vowel teams. We kind of moved away from that and went into a more whole language approach, right? A, a more like implicit way of teaching phonics. Well, we realized through the research that that is not the best way students were falling behind in reading. And so, of course, the pendulum swings the other way and we moved towards a an explicit systematic approach to phonics and reading as a whole. And that means that we are teaching each skill individually and then we are bringing them all together to help us with reading. And that's going to make more sense as I work through some of these problems for you. Okay. So I just want to make sure you understand all of that, but, um, think explicit systematic phonics instruction, just like in math, you start off with addition, then you move to subtraction, then you move to addition of multiple digits. You know how the skills build on the next skills. The same thing is happening in reading. Okay. All right. So I want to talk to you quickly about some foundational skills in reading that you'll really need to know. And we're going to hop over to my presentation really quickly. And I'm just going to go through this. Now, if you guys are at home and you're on the webinar, you got the free study guide. Okay. And so let me show you what that looks like. And my presentation is basically the study guide just blown up bigger for presentation purposes. Okay. So let me go ahead and share, um, my screen here. And while you guys are looking for that, I just want to make sure that purposes. I want to make sure I'm live here. Okay. I like to see um, my video going. So I know that I'm sharing screen. Okay. So this is my presentation here, but we are also going to be working from this free study guide here. Okay. You should have downloaded this. Um, if you are in the webinar right now, if you are watching on social media, you can download this later. Please understand I'm going to be projecting this to all of you. So you don't have to scramble to, to download this right now. Okay. You can just follow along and then download it later and work through it. Everything I do today is in this study guide and anything extra I do will be given to you guys later in an email. All right. So let's have a look at the specs. And of course I always put the, um, the blueprint and the test specifications in everything that I have. So this is from the free study guide, but notice in the paid study guide, this is what the digital paid study guide looks like. I have everything broken up by content category and there's just like all the specs are here. And then I fill in all the information underneath 
the specs here. So there's a ton of information in the actual study guide. All right. But let's just go back to the free study guide really quick. You can see that there are six content categories for this exam. We have phonological and phonemic awareness, including emergent literacy right here, content category one. Then we move up to phonics and decoding. Then we move to vocabulary and fluency, then comprehension, and then writing. And then the last portion of this test, and this goes for the STR exam and the Pearson Foundations of Reading, the last portion is the constructed response. And that's where you will have to write. And I'm going to go over an essay today so you can see how that goes. Now, I just want you to kind of have a look. Let me zoom in here. Oop, that might be too much, but let me just go to here. Okay. Have a look at these content categories here. So content category one is phonological and phonemic awareness. So that is, those two skills are the foundational skills of reading. They have to do with our listening and our oral skills. They have to do with the sounds in words, okay? You have to have those foundational skills, that emergent literacy, in order to move on to the next skill, which is phonics. Now phonics has to do with decoding. And again, I'm gonna go through this more explicitly as we get into the question so you can see it in action. But I want you to understand that the blueprint of this test progresses as students' skills progress. Content category one are the most basic skills. Content category two, now we're moving up to phonics and decoding. Content category three, now we're getting a little more advanced, vocabulary and fluency. Content category four now is comprehension, which is a much higher skill, a critical thinking skill where we're using lots of different processes in our brain. Then we get to writing. That's the final skill, right? And then, of course, you then have to put it all together in order to write the constructed response, okay? So that's really, really important when we're talking about the test. Notice it's a progression of skills, the science of teaching reading. Okay. So let me go back here and I'm just going to stop sharing here. Okay. So a couple of things. We start off with our listening skills. All right. So we are we're listening first. When we're babies, when we're little kids, we start by listening. Then we move to oral communication, okay? So first we listen, then we speak, then we read, then we write. Make sure you understand that progression um, and make sure you understand that those are the basic skills. Now, here's something to, to think about when we're talking about reading skills. Phonemic and phonological awareness are the base skills, okay? They have to do with listening, and speaking the sounds in words. You do not have to see the word in order to have phonemic and phonological awareness. These are those base skills that students have to have to move on. So with phonemic awareness, we are listening to the sounds in words and we're communicating the sounds in words. So for example, if I say the word, and I always use this one because it's super easy, but if I say the word bat, and I say, how many sounds in the word bat? And you say, b, a, t, three sounds. You have just segmented the individual sounds in the word bat, and that is phonemic awareness. Now, you didn't have to see the word. I just said the word to you. If you were my student and I said, say the word bat and say the three individual sounds in the word, and you went b, a, t. You just demonstrated phonemic awareness and we did not have to see the word. We're not concerned about the letters. We're not concerned about any kind of vowel teams or silent E's, any rules in the word. We are just listening to the sounds and then communicating them orally. So phonemic and phonological awareness are done orally and through our listening skills. When I was becoming a reading teacher, the reading coach told me you can do phonemic awareness in the dark. You don't have to see to do phonemic awareness. Now, once we have phonemic and phonological awareness, then we move into phonics. And phonics is we have to see the word. There are rules inside of words. So I want you to make sure for this exam, you understand that phonemic awareness, 
and phonological awareness are listening and oral skills. We do not write. We do not look at the word. We are communicating by listening and speaking. And then phonics is the next step up. And that's where we see the words and write the words. Okay. And well, we don't actually write the words. We see the words and decode the words. Now let's dig down deep into th those particular skills. I just want to make sure that you understand the difference. Okay. All right. So let me go back to sharing my screen here. Okay. So now we're on my presentation and you can see, I have this umbrella here. Um, and we have phonemic awareness. Now phonemic awareness is the very first skill that students get. This is listening to words and communicating the sounds and words. Now with phonemic awareness, like I said before, we have the word bat and I'm only writing it for you. Let me just make that a little bit better. Let me separate it a little bit better here. I'm only writing it for the purposes of this presentation. But if we were teaching it, we would not write it down. We would just communicate it orally. So let's say I have the word bat and these are in distinct sounds, b, a, t. And I have phonemic awareness when I can tell you there are three sounds or the first sound is b or the last sound is t. Notice I didn't say the first sound is b because b is a letter. I say the first sound is b because that's the sound. So be very careful there. Now that's the basics, just understanding individual sounds in words. When we have phonological awareness, we can actually blend those sounds, we can manipulate those sounds, and we can do different things with those sounds. So for example, in the word bat, I might have students segment the word by their sounds by the onset and rhyme. Now the onset is the first consonant sound, b, and the rhyme, and that's R-I-M-E, is the vowel and consonant sound that comes after. So notice I'm kind of blending these sounds here. I'm blending, I, I segmented the B off and then I'm blending the at. I'm not saying at, I'm blending the at. So not only do we have phonemic awareness where we understand the individual sounds in the words, but then we have phonological awareness where we can blend them and manipulate them, delete some sounds. I might say, say the word bat and delete the rhyme from the word. And the students would go, buh, but they knew to delete the at sound, that blended sound at the end. Now this can have lots of different complex strategies. We can be doing lots of different things with onset and rhyme and other ways in which we use phonological awareness. It is learned on a continuum and I go through that very extensively in the study guide. Let me go back here. If you get the study guide, you can see I get into the blending onsets and rhymes. And also I take you through the phonemic awareness and phonological awareness continuum here. So it's very important that you understand these skills are learned on a continuum, that there are actually um, individual skills within phonemic awareness, within phonological awareness. But the biggest thing you need to understand is that phonemic awareness and phonological awareness are done orally and they are sounds only. Okay. We are not, this has to do with sounds. Sorry. My handwriting is not very pretty today. Sounds only. Now, once we have that phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, we can move into phonics. Now phonics, you have to see, I'm going to put a little eyeball here. Please forgive my terrible eyeball. Okay. So with phonics, we have to see the word. Why? Because phonics has codes in them. It's code based. When we see the word sell, cycle, receive, and city, right? If we see that a Y follows this, oops, my thing just turned off. Hang on one second. Give me one second. I just lost the screen, of course. Hang on. Sorry. I'm coming back. Give me one second. 
There we go. Okay. I don't know why that happened, but it turned off. Okay. So if we have the word cycle, we can see that this Y follows this C here. And when that happens, the C makes a S sound, right? It doesn't make a K sound. It makes a S sound. Well, how do we know that? Well, we learned a rule, right? We, we learned the code. We learned that when a C is followed by an E, I, or Y, it makes a S sound. But I have to see the word in order to know that it's followed by a, a Y, an E, or an I, right? That's why it's code-based and we have to look at the word. For example, in the word phone, if I see the P and the H together, I know that makes a F sound. Well, I have to see the P and the H together. If I'm just using this, if I say the word phone to you and I say we're doing a phonemic awareness or phonological awareness activity, if I said, what's the first sound in the word phone, you would just say F, right? But if we were doing a phonics lesson, I would have you look at the word phone and understand that in our English language, when a P and an H are together, they make a F sound or a F sound. That's why we call phonics letter sound correspondence, also sometimes called phoneme grapheme correspondence. Well, what are phonemes? Phonemes, as in phonemic awareness, phonemes are individual sounds in words. Well, what are graphemes? Graphemes are these codes in words. That's why we call phonics letter sound correspondence or sometimes referred to phoneme sound grapheme letter correspondence. Notice we have both going on. We have the letter. I have to look at the letter, see the letter, see the Y going after the C, see the P and the H together. I have to see that in order to determine the sound. That's why phonics is a step up from phonological and phonemic awareness. All right. So we start off here, phonological awareness and phoneme. Well, we start here. One, two, three. And if you look at the test specs, it goes in that order. Content category one is phonemic and phonological awareness. Content category two is phonics and decoding. That's why they call this decoding because we are decoding the words. We're looking at the, the, the codes and the words, breaking them down to figure out the words. And again, this is explicit. This is systematic. We are not just hoping kids get it and say, oh, if they see the word phone enough, they'll know that a P and an H together make an F sound. Yes, that's true. If they read it enough, they can get it holistically, right? They can get it through whole language. However, we have learned through research that in order for students to really understand phonics, it needs to be taught explicitly. And that's why we start off with phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, we move into phonics, and then we move into uh, fluency and vocabulary, which is we're reading multiple words on the page. And then we're moving into comprehension, which means we're understanding multiple words on a page. And then we move into writing where we are communicating all of that by applying this information. Okay. All right. Let me just hop back over to my thing here and just see if we have any questions. Well, I don't have any questions inside of the webinar right now, but I just want to make sure everybody understands that progression of skills. That's going to help you because you're going to get questions that are very specific, phonemic awareness versus phonological awareness versus phonics. And in order to pass this exam, you need to understand. Now, I go into it way more in depth in the study guide. I also have some videos on YouTube and things like that. And I soon will have an online course for this. It's almost done. I really wanted to have it done today. It's just not done today, unfortunately. But um, you'll get an email when it's ready. It's a very, very, um, very, very comprehensive. I go into it even more, okay? Now let's take a look at a practice test question that's going to test your knowledge about phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, and phonics. This is not in the free study guide. This is 
I added it later because I found it and I thought it was a really good question to go along with what I'm talking about right now. But if you signed up for the webinar, you're going to get this presentation. So don't worry, you will be able to see it. So, um, so we will go there. Okay. Megan is asking, can you please say the names of phonics one more time? Okay. Let me go back to my presentation. I'm going to do it one more time because it is, it's confusing. They all start with pH, right? And they kind of sound the same. So we have phonemic awareness is number one, phonemic. We understand that there are individual sounds in words. Then we have phonological awareness. I like to say that we are logical in this one. We've got the phonemic awareness, the individual sounds. Now we're logical about how we put them all together. I don't know. It's kind of dumb, but my mind, you know, we all have our ways of remembering things. Um, and so this is phonemic awareness is number one. Phonological awareness is number two. Okay. Next is phonics, which is code-based learning. Remember, we have letter sound correspondence. The letters provide the codes. The sounds are those phonemes, all right? So one more time, phonemic awareness is the first skill, understanding individual sounds in word. words. Phonological awareness is a step up. We are logical about how we put them all together. And then phonics is the next step where we're actually looking at the words and the codes and deciphering those. Now let's have a look at what it looks like in context, okay? So this is not part of the free study guide. I wanted to add this because I think it's an important. All right, so you know I'm always going to start with the answer choices first because that's how I do things. Remember, backwards, working backwards helps. So it helps me figure out which thing, what's going on. It helps me set the purpose for this question here. You don't have to adopt this, but many people have, and they've passed their tests by working backwards. So we have A, have students point to each letter in the words and name the letters. Okay, pointing and naming. B, have students say each individual sound in a word. Okay, well, I just know each individual sound in the word, this is phonemic awareness. Okay, Present students with words they already know and then analyze the letter sound relationships and patterns, also the codes. This is phonics, right? We have just the sounds and we're just saying it orally. That's phonemic awareness. And then we have the letter sound relationships and patterns. That's phonics. So phonemic awareness is here. Phonics is in C and D, have students use con a connected text strategies to figure out unfamiliar words. Well, this is vocab. All right, let's have a look at the question. A teacher is working on phoneme grapheme correspondence. Well, what is that? That's letter sound relationships. Remember I told you it's the same thing. Phonemes are the sounds. Graphemes are the letters. Well, that's the same thing as saying letter sound correspondence. This is going to be C. Which of the following would be most effective? It, this is not phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is just the sounds. If it says the teacher is working on individual sounds and words or the teacher is working on phonemic awareness, let's just say they put the word up in there, then you could choose B. But in this case, we're looking at grapheme or, or letters. And when we are looking at letters, we are talking about phonics. So you'll get questions like this. And if you don't understand the process of reading, these, these questions are really difficult. So make sure you understand all those different nuances there. All right. All right. Now let's get into the actual study guide. So this is number one on the study guide. If you don't have the study guide in front of you, don't worry. I'm going to project it here for you. So let's just start working through the study guide and then, um, We'll get, we'll get into it and I'll start explaining things as we look at questions in context. Okay. All right. Let's go with the answer choices here. Students can remember all 26 letters in the alphabet. Mm, this kind of sounds like a unnecessary situation to me. I know that we do need to know all 26 letters in the alphabet, but it's not something that I would I would focus on when we're talking about teaching reading, okay? B, students can trace letters properly with their fingers. Okay, that's a big part of the alphabetic principle So, um, and, and print concepts. Students can associate pictures with letters on flashcards. Okay, this is also part of the alphabetic principle. I'm going to explain what the alphabetic principle is in a second. And D, students can spell phonetically using their letter sound correspondence. Okay, that also sounds like phonics. 
but they're spelling phonetically which means they're spelling things the way they sound. So they don't really have phonics, but it is the beginning of phonics. For example, if you ask the student to spell the word uh, beach, let's just say, and they spelt it be beach like that, and they didn't understand that the real spelling is B-E-A-C-H, right? We have this vowel team here. But they know that the B is a bus sound and the E is in there and the C and the H, like they kind of got it. Then, then you know they're spelling phonetically, meaning, remember, phone, the way things sound. And that's the beginning uh, that's the beginning of phonics. So it's important, but it is part of the alphabetic principle. So we have a bunch of alphabetic principles in here. Let's, t let's look at the question here. Which of the following exercises would demonstrate students are beginning to understand the alphabetic principle? So they're beginning to understand what it's all about here. Okay. Tracing letters with their fingers doesn't necessarily mean they're understanding the alphabetic principle. The alphabetic principle, in a sense, is the beginning of phonics, like we said here. Students are understanding that letters represent sounds, that also words represent meanings. You know, they see books and they see words in the books and they know the teacher's reading that book. Those words mean something. Now, this happens through exposure. This happens through explicit teaching. But they start to understand, like, for example, if you give a student a card or you hold up a card with a sun on it and the letter S, they can distinguish between like, this is the letter, this is the picture. They start distinguishing between pictures and letters and they can associate um, that. So the best answer choice here is going to be D because they are spelling phonetically, which means they understand that these letters in here make sounds. We, they don't do it properly yet. They're not there yet, but they understand that they make sounds. And this is the beginning part of phonics. They start to understand this. So D is the best answer there. Okay. Let's have a look at number two. Now, this is a, um, it looks like we've got phonemic awareness here. So which of the following would not be a systematic instructional strategy? I'm reading the question first here because the answer choices are so short and this not sticks out to me. So if I were taking the test, my eye is going to the not. So we're looking at something that is not a systematic instructional strategy for phonemic awareness. Remember, phonemic awareness is the first skill, that baby skill we need. And we're looking for the not answer or the incorrect answer here. So identifying beginning sounds and words. Well, that is systematic instruction of phonemic awareness. So A is not the answer because we're looking for the incorrect answer. Clapping syllables and sounds. Okay. That's not necessarily phonemic awareness. That might be my answer here. Let's just leave it alone. D, identifying the ending sounds in words. Well, this is not going to be our answer because that is systematic pho phonemic awareness. If I say, what is the first sound in the word bat? And you said, buh, you are working on phonemic awareness. And then D, deleting sound in words. Well, that is also phonemic awareness, right? If I said, say the word spat and the kids say spat and I say, say the word spat without the t sound at the end and they went spat. That is phonemic awareness, and it's a deleting deletion activity, which I go into more in depth in the study guide, but that's a deletion activity. activity. Now, clapping syllables, now we're using bigger pieces of the words, right? So let's say I have students clap the syllables in, I'm just going to use this word, careful. Now, I'm writing it for you. If we were doing uh, phonological awareness, we wouldn't write it. See, B is actually phonological awareness, not phonemic awareness. So if I said, let's break up the word careful into two syllables, and we went careful. Notice we're combining all of the sounds in care, and then we're combining all of the sounds in full. Remember, with phonological awareness, we're logical in blending sounds, segmenting sounds, but in bigger chunks. B is going to be phonological awareness, and that's why it's the answer, because we're looking at phonemic awareness here, not phonological. A is phonemic, C is phonemic, D is phonemic, B is phonological. All right, let's have a look at number three. So we have um, the answer choices here, just single things, and then we have this particular um, 
diagram or, or diagram here and we can see that we have a spelling word and student answer and i can see the student is messing up the spelling right the spelling word is sign she writes sing the spelling word is depend she writes dipnid the spelling word is girl she spells grill okay so right away I can look at the answer choices and see that it's probably not syllables because most of these are single syllable words. It could be sequencing because we have these uh, messed up sequences. She's messing up the, um, the sequencing of the phonemes in the words. It's not onset and rhyme because we're not separating this out by onset, g, Earl rhyme. We're not doing that here. I don't think it's onset and rhyme. And then silent letters, that's not, we don't really have any silent letters here. I mean, in sign we do, but the rest of them don't. So right away I can see this might be phoneme sequencing. Let's have a look at the question. A student is taking a spelling test and is struggling with a few words. Which of the following skills would the teacher focus on working with a student? We can see the student has messed up the spelling. She switched out the, the, the graphemes. She, she switched out the letters and that's going to mess up the phoneme sequencing, right? The sound sequencing. And this is a phonics situation. I know we're talking about phonemes, but remember phonics is phoneme graphing correspondence. And that's what's happening here. She's messing up the graphemes, the letters, which is messing up the phonemes, the sequencing. And that's why B would be the best answer. Let's have a look at number four, answer choices, silent letters are controlled, blending and common vowel combinations. Let's read the question here. Students have mastered consonant sounds, okay, and short vowel sounds. Okay, so that is um, phonemic awareness. We're talking about sounds. Which of the following would be the most appropriate next step in the teaching sequence? Okay, this is a situation where you have to understand that science of teaching reading where students are progressing through the skills. So we've mastered consonant sounds and we mastered short vowel sounds. Now this is where the study guide is really gonna help you because I have the progression of skills laid out in a table. But just so you know, consonant sounds and short vowel sounds are at the beginning stages of phonemic awareness. And then when if we were working on phonics, they are the beginning um, the beginning stages of phonics when we when we understand consonants and short vowel sounds, okay? Now, if we were gonna make a step up, we would probably go to blending those sounds, right? Because if we have phonemic awareness of the beginning consonant sounds, maybe the medial short vowel sounds, now we would start to blend them together with phonological awareness. So C looks like it's my answer, but let's discredit A, B, and D. Silent letters is relatively advanced. We have to tell students, oh, guess what? In the word make, this A is long and this is a silent E. And anytime an E follows a consonant at the end of the word, it's typically silent. That's very advanced. That's not going to be the next step after just understanding consonant and short vowel sounds. So that's out. B, R controlled vowels, that's like letter. That's going to be E-R-A-R-O-R-U-R-I-R. -R -R -R. And again, that is much more advanced than blending these long vowel sounds with consonants. Okay, so that's going to be out. And then vowel combinations, this is actually really advanced too, because you have the O-U, what sound does that make? The A-W, this is a helping vowel. We have the E-A, the O-I, diphthong. I mean, these are like very complex to understand all those vowel combinations. So D is out. The next step in this progression is going to be C, based on what I understand in the question here. All right, let's go into number five. We have memorized high frequency words, read independently to practice. Typically on this test, reading independently is not the correct answer. I'm just gonna do a soft X on that. The reason why is because this test is focused on students who are struggling to read or beginning readers. And reading independently is really once we kind of grasp everything. So independent reading is an amazing practice and we should be using it in our classroom. But on this test, it's typically not the right answer. I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but it's a lot of the time, not the right answer. Use phonics to decode words. Okay, I like it. Use uh, Work on students' phonemic awareness. Okay, 
Let's have a look at the question. As a student reads, she attempts to decode words. So right away, I can cross off D because we're talking decoding. That's phonics. C looks like it's my answer. Let's keep reading. She's trying to decode words like want and would. Oh, notice these are, these are um, high frequency words, okay? Which of the following strategies should the teacher use to help the students in this process? Well, notice I went towards C first to use phonics to decode words. Well, in this case, we have want and would. Now notice that would is a, it's got a weird OU sound in it and want, that's not want, it doesn't follow the phonics rules. So in this case, I would cross off C and go with A. These are high frequency words that occur a lot in text. And so in this case, rather than spend the time on decoding, we would want to just allow the student to memorize these words so that when they show up in our reading, we're easily, we, we get through them easily. Now, there is debate on this as well. I just want to address <laughs> some people believe that we should be decoding even sight words. And, you know, that's an approach. But on this test, there will be some questions about uh, sight word memorization. Sight words are also called high frequency words because they occur a lot in texts. And so rather than spend time on decoding, they don't follow the rules, right? They don't fo follow the phonics generalizations. And so in this case, we would just want to memorize them. Now, another quick note, memorization, the only time it's usually correct on this exam is when we're talking about high frequency words. We're not using memorization for other things or, you know, we, memorization should be attached to high frequency words only on this exam. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at number six. We have what type of vocabulary application is she using? So we have incidental, systematic, accidental, not a, not a vocabulary instruction and direct. Okay. So, uh, direct and systematic are the same direct instruction and systematic instruction are the same. I'm gonna put a little X here and a little X there. If we're looking at a multiple choice question, this, this is where the strategy comes in. If we're looking at a multiple choice question and we have two that are basically the same and I'm only allowed to pick one right answer, we can typically cross those off. I'm going to put little tiny X's next to them. All right, let's go ahead and read the question. Students are talking loudly as they enter the classroom. The teacher says, please avoid horseplay and loud chatter when entering the classroom. It causes cacophony and sets a disorganized tone for the rest of the class. Look at these words she is using, which I love it when teachers use complex vocabulary in their classrooms because students pick up on it because this is called incidental vocabulary. And when we speak this way to students, they start to speak this way themselves. And so this is going to be the best thing here. Now, systematic and direct vocabulary instruction would mean that we are actually looking at each word, perhaps talking about the definition, breaking it up, figuring out the prefixes, suffixes, and roots for, for meaning. Um, that is more systematic and explicit or direct. But in this case, it's incidental. We're using it in our daily lives. We're modeling good vocabulary. That's why A is the correct answer there. All right, number seven, reading and writing, speaking and listening, listening and reading, speaking and writing. Okay, I need the question. A teacher wants to work on students' expressive vocabulary. What would be the most effective activity? Well, when we express, we... Uh, write and speak, right? Let's think about this. When we read, we are receiving. When we read words on the page, we're receiving the information. And when we listen, we are receiving the information. But when we speak, we are expressing the information. And when we write, we are expressing the information. So make sure you know that reading and listening is uh, receiving and writing and, uh, speaking is expressing. Okay. And in this case, D is going to be the best answer there. All right. Let's have a look at number eight. Have students copy words from a glossary? Absolutely not. Never the right answer on this test. We used to do it. I'm Gen X. <laughs> so this was like a big part of our daily routine was to copy words from a glossary. It's typically not the best answer here. So always cross it off when you're looking at the answer choices. Glossaries are good tools 
to use, but copying words is not going to be the best type of instruction. B, have students use vocabulary words in a five paragraph essay. Okay, I like the application of vocabulary words, but this five paragraph essay jumps out as a eh. For me, death to the five paragraph essay. I talk about that a lot in my videos. It doesn't sound like the best thing here, so I'm gonna cross it off. C, have students use an interactive word wall to use words in context. Oh, love it. Interactive, good word in context with vocabulary, good word. We're learning those words in an incidental way, just like we talked about in that other answer choice. We're learning them by reading them, by understanding them. C looks like it's got all my good words in it. And in my study guide, I have a whole list of good words for you to think about on this test. D, have students circle the vocabulary words in a piece of text. This is a good strategy um, for pre-reading, but I don't love it as much as I love C. Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following would be most effective in teaching student tier three words in a science classroom? All right. So when, when we're talking about tier three words, we're talking about high level academic words like mitochondria, photosynthesis, if we're in a science class, right? Um, uh, God, I'm trying to think about um nucleic acid. Okay. These words are very science based. And so what we would probably want to do is be systematic in teaching these words and also use context as we read and an interactive word wall and using words in context is going to be best there. Make sure you know your tier one words, which are high frequency words. Tier two occur a lot in text, but are more complicated like the word irrelevant or um, acclimate. Those are word tier two words. So you don't see them all the time, but they are in text a lot. And then tier three are your domain specific or your, um, your uh, academic words like mitochondria, photosynthesis, things like that. All right, let's have a look at number nine here. We have reading through the text, only stopping at words he or she needs to decode, reading with infre inflection and expression, reading effortlessly at 95% accuracy, or greater than 95% accuracy, I should say, and D, reading through uh, the text using sight words. Okay, I'm not sure that doesn't sound great, using sight words the whole time, probably not the right answer. Let's read the question. If a student is reading with automaticity, the student is reading effortlessly and the student is at greater than 95% accuracy. And you might say, wow, that's really high, greater than 95% accuracy. Yes, in order for a student to be in the automatic stage, they are moving through the text, making very few errors. I'm sure many of you have seen students read in their texts and you, you know how laborious it can be. They're reading and they're stopping and they're decoding every word. It's like tiring to listen to them, right? And even if it's just a few words, it can really break up the reading so they, it affects, it messes with comprehension. When they're automatic, they are cruising. They are reading at greater than 95% accuracy, and that's why C is the best answer. Now, reading with inflection and expression, that's prosody, where they're stopping at periods, pausing at commas, reading with expression, with a question mark at the end, you know, those types of things. Very important for fluency, but not part of the autom uh, automatic portion, okay? And of course, if they're automatic, they're not decoding. A is out. We're not decoding. And uh, reading through the text with sight words, this is nonsense. Uh, D is out. All right, let's have a look. We're almost there. Number 10. A, differentiated instruction with targeted interventions. Oh my gosh, already. I love this answer choice. Notice why I work backwards on this test. A lot of times you can get to the correct answer or very close to the correct answer without even having to read the question. So these are all good words. Differentiated instruction, targeted intervention. Another good word like this is scaffolding to support students. A's got all the good stuff. B, partner reading to focus on key vocabulary. That's a good practice, but not as good as my answer choice A here. C, comprehension games for maximum engagement. Stay away from games on this test. We use them. They're great, but on this test, games with winners and losers and stuff when it has to do with reading is typically not the correct answer. And whole group memorization strategies, absolutely not. Memorization strategies, remember I told you memorization should only be um, connected with high frequency words on this exam. Let's have a look at the question. Several students in a class are struggling. If they're struggling, they're gonna need targeted interventions with comprehension skills. Which of the following would be most effective? A is the best. It's got all the good words in it when it comes to reading instruction. All right, number 11. Now these are your longer questions, right? And this is why I 
start with the answer choices first, because what happens with this, if you start here and you read this question, then you read all the answer choices, then you got to go back up and read the question again. Then you read some of the answer choices again. You're going back and forth and it's a mess. Let's start with the answer choices first, when we, especially with these types of questions. A, the teacher should have the student focus on spelling because spelling is phonics. This is true. And phonics is a necessary part of the comprehension process. Okay, this is true actually. So I'll leave it. Okay. I'm not in love with it, but it is true. B, the teacher should have the student take a diagnostic test and then have the reading coach work with the student right away. It's out. Do we have reading coaches? Yes. Do they work with students? Yes. On this test? No. On this test, you're the teacher. You need to fix it in your own classroom using differentiated instruction, scaffolds, and all of that. If this were take a diagnostic test to identify the student's weaknesses and then work in a small group to administer targeted interventions, yes. But as soon as you bring in the reading coach, it's a no for me. C, the teacher should use a running record to record miscues and uh, miscues a student demonstrates during a one minute reading. Okay. A running record is a tool we use. I don't love this. Um, I'm going to leave it, but I don't, I don't love this answer choice. D the teacher should focus on fluency and automaticity strategies for the student because proper fluency and automaticity will reduce the cognitive demand needed for decoding, leaving more cognitive space for comprehension. Oh, this is a good one. Here's why. When students are fluent readers, when they have that automaticity, they can move through the text without using a bunch of their brain muscle or their cognitive demand on decoding words. And instead they can use that, that information in their brain to understand the text. So we want them to be automatic when they're reading through these fluency passages, because every time they stop to decode a word, they're using up cognitive energy. This is also called cognitive endurance, or it's called, you know, cognitive demand. We want to save the cognitive demand for the analytical thinking skills, for the comprehension skills that they're going to be doing as they comprehend the text. So D looks like it's my answer. Let's have a look at the question. A student is struggling during reading. The student often stops when encountering high frequency words and tries to decode them. This interrupts the reading and makes it difficult for the student to understand the meaning of text. Which of the following interventions? D is still my best answer here. Now, you might say, well, spelling, because it's phonics and phonics is necessary. Yeah, but we're talking about high frequency words here. We need to work on automaticity, probably with some memorization of high frequency words and what to do when we encounter these words. Spelling isn't going to be the best situation here. A is out. We're looking for the um, most effective always when we're doing this. And C, running record with miscues, no, that's not going to get the student automatic. We need to work on automatic repeated reading, proper fluency, all of that. All right, let's have a look at number 12. Encourage students to memorize portions of the text. Nope. Encourage students to ask questions about the test. Yes, I love asking questions. Asking questions is a big part of comprehension. So I like B, I'm going to put a little star next to it. C, encourage students to partner read. Partner reading is a good, um, a good activity, but I don't love it as much as I love B. D, encourage to, um, students to read the text for homework. Nope, homework, bad word on this exam. Cross it off. Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following would be most effective in developing students' comprehension of complex text? Here it is right here, questioning. We're going to talk about this in the constructed response in just a second. But when we use questioning techniques, we are fostering students' um, comprehension. So asking questions always goes with comprehension. Remember that. Also metacognition, but I'm going to talk about that in a minute. All right, let's go to number 13 here. Okay, this, you can see by the answer choices, we have text structure here, a big part of reading comprehension, problem and solution, chronological, descriptive, and cause and effect. When we're talking about comprehension with students, we want them to understand text structure. Is this a problem solution text? Is this a chronological text? Is this an argumentative text or descriptive text, cause and effect? So you will have to identify the text structures inside little passages on this test. So let's have a look. We have a powerful tornado appeared out of nowhere. It was a tri-state tornado with high winds going about 200 miles per hour. The people in the town were terrified because they'd never seen a tornado of this size. Over 200 homes were destroyed. 
Now you may, you may be tempted to choose problem solution, but there is no solution given in this thing. We're just describing a tornado and what happened because of the tornado. It's not chronological because it doesn't go in order. It's just kind of telling you what's going on. We have it happened. People were uh, scared. Um, their homes were destroyed, stuff like that. Now, again, you might say descriptive, but in a descriptive text, you're going to have very descriptive words like the uh, dark spinning cyclone of the tornado was a ravenous, I don't know, something was a, was a monster coming down the highway at high speeds. You're really going to dig into that description in a very poetic, you're using the sensory details, uh, sight, sound, smell, touch. That's more of a descriptive. So C is not happening here. They do describe it, but it's not a descriptive. This is a cause and effect right? So there were 200 homes destroyed. People were terrified. Those are the effects that this tornado caused. Okay. Now, if there were even more information about this, maybe they were talking about climate change and those caused tornadoes, you would have multiple pieces of cause and effect in here. But in this case, the cause is the tornado. The effect is destroyed homes and terrified citizens. Let's have a look at number 14. Now we're getting into the writing portion of the exam. So let's have a look at the answer choices. Use a linking word activity to help students achieve sentence variety. A is a good answer choice because linking words and sentence variety are typically what you are going to be helping students do when they work on their writing skills. Students start off with very robotic sentences and we wanna show them how to link them together to make things flow nicely, all right? B, work on a punctuation worksheet. Eh, worksheet's out. Typically on this test, worksheet is not the correct answer. Not saying 100% of the time, but 99% of the time. C, diagram sentences to help students understand prepositional phrases. I like diagramming sentences. That's a good practice. I'm going to keep C. And D, work on modes of writing so students can improve persuasive writing. Okay, modes of writing, whether it's persuasive, narrative, expository, that works too. I definitely take off B, but A, I'm leaning towards A. Let's have a look at the student's writing. Julie and Mary go to the same school. Julie likes math. Mary likes reading. Julie and Mary have been friends for a long time. Notice it's very robotic. We could combine sentences here. You're going to see this a lot on the test when it comes to writing. A, use a linking word, and variety or sentence variety is a good word on the test. All right, last question here. The ability to adapt communication in relation to audience, task, purpose, and discipline. All right, right away, this tells me this is a writing question, content category five. And the most important thing when we teach students how to write is understand their audience, task, and purpose. This is all over my study guide and in my videos. A looks like it's a correct answer here. Let's take a look at B. The ability to use transition words to give variance and flow. Again, I like transition words and variance and flow. I like B. I don't like it as much as A, but I'm going to keep it, put a little dot. C, the, the ability to use proper grammar and punctuation. Typically not the correct answer when we're talking about developing students' writing skills. Yes, we teach grammar. Yes, we te teach punctuation. It's very important. But when we are teaching students how to write, we're focusing more on the process of writing rather than the editing. Editing comes later. D, the ability to organize paragraphs so the writing has continuity. Organization is important, but I don't love it as much as A and B. Let's read the question. Which of the following is most important for students to consider when they are writing? The most important thing is your audience. Who are you writing to? The task. What are you going to write? And the purpose, why are you going to write it? This is the foundation of writing. And then, of course, the discipline, perhaps it's a science text or a, or a um, social studies text uh, piece of writing or something like that. But in this case, audience, task, and purpose, number one, 15 is A. All right, let me go into my webinar here and let's have a look. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Let me go. Um, okay. So will your online course help with K-12 reading endorsement? Well, we don't focus on FTCE at all. We only focus on Praxis, but like I said before, the reading exams are very similar. Okay. 
Um, if we have a couple people who joined late, it's okay. You're going to get the replay. You can watch it again and again. So don't worry about it. You guys are going to get this. Um, do you have a list of terminology within your study guide? Yes, I do. So let me just share before we go on to the constructed response really quickly, I'm going to share the study guide because people are asking a lot of questions and I want you to know that we have the resources. Let me find my study guide. Here it is. Okay. So you can see that we have all of this here. We have all of this terminology. We have all the skills, sorry. We have all the skills about onset and rhyme, blending, substitution, um, all the different skills, rhyme, alliteration. I also have tables, let me go here into phonics. I have tables that show you exactly what skills start first and what skills go last in terms of phonics. We have, I don't know why this is right clicking. Give me a second. We have all the different rules of phonics here with all the different ways in which they are presented. Um, we have all of the single letters, doublets, digraphs, diphthongs, all the ways in which you will teach phonics. And I mean, everything, we, this, this study guide is very comprehensive. This is just phonics. Let's go to what are we going? Uh, this is fluency. We go through all the things in fluency, all the major skills, even activities that you'll see on the exam that help with fluency, basal reading, running records, miscue cue analysis. It's far too much for me to get through in one free webinar on online, but there is so much here. Of course, let's go to uh, comprehension, literary and informational text. We go through graphic organizers. We go through the difference between informational and literary text. We go through all the different strategies you're going to use. We go through all the, you know, SQ3R, these strategies you're going to see on the exam. We also have test tips. These are things that you should be on the lookout for when you're on the exam. There are certain little traps they'll uh, get you with. We also have, you know, uh, ways in which student thinking is the progression. Some people were asking about tier one, tier two, and tier three vocabulary. That's all laid out in the study guide. And we also have ways in which students would use context clues like inference clues. All of this is assessed on the exam. And then of course, let's get into writing. Where's the writing? Hang on. Is this writing? Yeah. Uh, no, comprehension still. Let's go here. And at the end of each section, I have questions just for that. But then we get into writing. We talk about all the different ways. We talk about um, uh, you know first person narrative, second person narrative. All this is assessed on the test. It's it's a lot. It's it's a tough exam. All right. And then of course um, I have problems just for writing. Each section has its own practice problems. And then at the end we have the constructed response, also with assessment. And I actually have. Um, 20 questions just on assessment because, and I'm going to talk about this when we do the constructed response, you have to understand assessment in reading. What assessment are you going to use to figure out what students need and then how, what students need, and then how are you going to intervene? This is all very important. And then of course we have the constructed response section where I go through the constructed responses. I have three of them here for you and samples and why they are a three. And then of course the good words list. We talked about I keep telling you good words in the answer choices. We have a good words list at the end of the study guide in order for you to understand um, what's going on there. Okay. So, and, if, uh, and then the practice tests. Now also with the practice tests, I want you to know, let me go here, hang on. These are very detailed answer explanations. If you have the study guide, please read the answer explanations, even if you get it correct, because sometimes you'll get something right because you've guessed properly and that's great, but you really need to understand why you got it correct in order for you to study properly for the exam. And also notice that I separate them out by category. So you know exactly what questions are coming from what section of the test. So you can then evaluate your own skills and determine where you are low and where you need to go. But these particular, look at how detailed these answer explanations are. They're detailed for a reason because I want you to understand what's going on. Okay. And then of course we have a bibliography. Everything we do is cited. And these are all the experts in reading that we have cited in our, um, in our book. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Let me just see if there's any more questions here. Okay. Um, Oh, Jackie, that's awesome. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, 
uh, there are some, there are there. So somebody's asking me about ELL students. There are things in the book about ELL English language learners, but please keep in mind, we're talking about beginning reading students and English language learners are beginning reading students. They are going to be learning phonemic awareness, phonological awareness in the second language. So really all these foundational skills you're teaching students who are, um, speakers of English, whose first language is English, you're doing all this same stuff with ELLs, okay? Um, will this help me with middle school content knowledge test? Uh, no, this is a different exam, but we have other webinars for that. If you go to my webinars page, I just did one on the PLT, you can check that out. Um, is there a difference between the teaching reading and the praxis reading and writing subtests? Um, you might be talking about the praxis core, and this is a different test. So the Praxis Teaching Reading is a subject area exam. This is not the Praxis Core. The Praxis Core is just your basic skills. It assesses your reading ability, your writing ability, and your math skills. This test assesses your ability to teach reading and writing and is an, as a teacher test. Um, Tanisha, no, we do not have 5024. We hope to, but we do not. Um, we have 5025, which is early childhood. But um, we're talking about the Praxis Teaching Reading. So I'm going to stay focused on that. Um, that's what this webinar is about. But we have lots of resources for other Praxis exams. All right, now let's talk about the constructed response, which is arguably the hardest part of this test. So let's go through that really quickly. I'm gonna show you some quick strategies to make that easier on you, okay? So just make sure I'm sharing here. Okay, so I just came up with this constructed response today, this one's separate, and I recommend that when you're done with this webinar, you go in and you write this, you write to this. You have to practice your writing skills in order to do this. You can't just go in and say, oh, I'm gonna do it on the day of. Like, practice it. We have lots of practice prompts in our book, and you can also just kind of, um, like I made up this prompt, you could make up different prompts based on different skills. Now, here's the other thing I want you to understand. You now have to take all of the information we talked about, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocab, comprehension, and writing, and apply them now. Now we're at the application stage of the test. You're gonna have to figure out what they're asking you here and use all that information in the book to do this. That's why I say, people say, oh, I didn't pass. And I said, well, did you read the study guide? And they say, no, I just did the practice test questions. Well, you're not going to pass if you just do the practice test questions. You got to read the information in the book because at the end, you're going to be asked a very nuanced question like this one. And without having understood everything in the book, you're not going to be able to answer these questions. And there are three and it's 25% of your grade. So rule number one, we are not going to start up here. No, no, no. We are going to start here at the tasks first, backwards. We start backwards. Oops, this should not be a, this should be a period. Sorry, I'll fix that. Um, we want to make sure that we work backwards on the constructed response. I want to know what my task is before I start reading all of this information here. Okay, so let's have a look. Identify two strategies Mr. Payton can use to increase students' comprehension skills. Keyword here comprehension. So we're not focusing on phonemic awareness. We're not focusing on phonics. We're focusing on comprehension. And we're going to explain why both strategies are important. All right, key, when we do constructed response, you need to make sure that you fulfill all of the tasks they are asking you. So really we need to do basically four things here. We need to identify a strategy number one and we need to show why it's important. That's two things. Number one, strategy one. Number two, why it's important. Number three, strategy two. Number four, why it's important. I'm going to turn this into a two paragraph response here right away. Both of my strategies are each going to get a paragraph. We're going to go strategy one paragraph, strategy two paragraph. I'm just going to map this very quickly. If I'm on test day, I'm going to use my scratch paper just to map really quick and it's two paragraphs. And then at the end of each paragraph, I'm going to explain why I picked the strategies and why they're important. So I'm going to tack this onto the end. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute. Okay, so I need two comprehension strategies. Now, before I even read, I know comprehension. Hang on. Okay, 
Sorry, my little thing stopped. Now, before I even read, I know comprehension because I have read the book. I know that metacognition is essential for comprehension. I know that questioning strategies are essential for comprehension. I know that fluency is essential for comprehension in order for students to free up that cognitive demand. Okay. So I know comprehension. So I'm going to apply that as I read this, but right away, if I'm looking here and I see comprehension skills, I know that I can do metacognition and questioning because those two skills are going to help with comprehension. I didn't even have to read the, the text in order to understand that I'm going to use these two things. Now I do have to read the thing here because I want to have an understanding, but right away, if I'm working on comprehension, I'm working on metacognition and I'm working on questioning. All right. So Mr. Simpson is a fourth grade reading teacher as he and his students read through the text. Mr. Simpson notices that many of his students struggle to comprehend the text's main idea and key details. Based on previous assessments, Mr. Simpson knows that his students have a solid grasp on phonics and vocabulary skills. So they're not struggling in phonics and vocab. However, they're struggling with comprehension, which is the next skill. It's actually two skills up. All right, so they're good on phonics, they're good on vocab, but something's happening here. Now, I could talk about fluency. I could say they need more fluency because we have phonics and vocab. The next step is fluency to comprehension. But I'm really good at metacognition and questioning. I know a lot about that. Okay, so I'm going to write to my strengths. I'm not going to come up with some stuff I don't really understand. I'm going to write to my strengths. And metacognition and questioning is very important. Okay, so I'm going to do. Um, Paragraph one, strategy one is going to be metacognition. Paragraph two is going to be questioning. Okay. I'm going to keep it nice and succinct, and I'm going to make it easy on the grader to give me a three on this. I want a three on this essay, a three from grader number one, a three from grader number two, because that's going to help me with my overall score. All right. So let's have a look at what I have here. Now, I apologize. This is a lot of text for a presentation, but it is a writing task. So I want to make sure you guys can see this. So let's start with paragraph number one. Remember what I said here. I'm going to start with metacognition. All right. That's paragraph number one. So notice what I do right away. The first strategy Mr. Payton can use to help students comprehend text is read aloud, think aloud to increase metacognition. I state it right away. I don't write an intro paragraph and start with all this fluffy stuff all over the place, making it hard on the person grading my essay. I go right to the strategy because then the grader goes, check, she did this part. She did one of this. She identified a strategy. So I've already done one of the four things I have to do here. Okay, check. And then I describe the strategy. He and his students can read the text aloud together. Then Mr. Payton can model his thinking process to students. And then I get specific here. This is very important. For example, now I'm going to get specific. Specifics are important when trying to get a three on this exam. When reading aloud, Mr. Payton can model how he summarizes, predicts, and processes the story. He can say, that is interesting. I wonder why the main character acted like that. Perhaps it will be answered later in the story. Notice he's modeling his thinking process. This is what metacognition is. I'm obsessed with metacognition. That's why I can write to it. He can also think aloud when he gets to difficult parts of the text. All right. So not only did I name the strategy, I gave you an example of the strategy, and I even did a little quotation of what it might sound like. I got very specific here. Now comes the second part of strategy one. Why is it important? Read aloud, think aloud is one of the most effective ways to increase metacognition and essential skill in reading comprehension. Notice I tacked it right at the end there. So this is check. I have my first strategy and why it's important. Now let's go to the second paragraph here. Right away, I say it. The next strategy, oh, I call him Mr. Payton. He should be Mr. Simpson. I apologize. I switched out the, the name. It should be Mr. Simpson. Apologize for that. Mr. Payton can use, we could also say the teacher. The next strategy the teacher can use to help students comprehend text is question gener uh, generation, which I put here, questioning techniques. I know that questioning helps with students' comprehension. Mr. Payton can use a KWL chart. This is one of the things we put in our 
study guide to help the students organize their questions. Notice I say question generation, overarching skill, then I get specific and I name the actual graphic organizer and use uh, them as they read. For example, here comes an even more specific situation. Students can fill out the K part of the KWL chart. What do we know already about the topic? This will help activate background knowledge and schema. This shows that I understand the reading process. Activating background knowledge and activating schema is important in order for students to understand the text. And then I say why it's important, which is key to understanding the text. I just hit that second portion of the task. Why is it important? Now I go to the next part of the KWL chart. Next, they can fill out the W part of the KWL chart. What do we want to know? Okay, this will help students generate questions that will uh, they will want to answer as they read. Again, why it's important. Finally, after they are done reading, they can answer the L part of the KWL chart. What did we learn from the reading? This will help them summarize the text and reflect upon important information they acquired while reading. So notice I kind of embedded why it's important after each portion of the KWL chart, but this one is check as well. I did the strategy and I did why it's important. All right. And I only wrote two paragraphs and I didn't write an intro and I didn't write a conclusion. I just get right into it and made it easier on the people grading my essay. All right. We're way over the time as usual. Um, so let me have a look. Um, so that's it. Uh, we are a little bit over just by 17 minutes. It's not bad for me. Usually it's much longer than that. I hope you guys enjoyed the webinar. We touched on a lot of stuff. I kind of crammed in a lot of stuff today, but if you need more help, we will be, uh, we have the, um, the, uh, the study guide. I have my YouTube channel. Let me just show you a couple free resources you can couple with this webinar. So if you go to my YouTube channel, I have a teaching reading playlist here, and I even have more constructed response stuff here. Um, some of the tests like Praxis Reading and Language Arts 5007, that's a very similar test to the 5205. Any teaching reading exam is going to help you. So if, if I did one on Pearson Foundations of Reading, Praxis 5007, 5007, 5205. All of these are going to help you. Um, and of course, I have other stuff about teaching and being data driven. I've been doing a lot of teacher videos that people have been liking about, you know, how to do routines and procedures, teacher interview, things like that. All right. Then, of course, we have our Facebook page. Let me go here. We have our Facebook page and we have lots of information there on um, what's going on. So definitely check out our Facebook page. Oops, share this tab instead. Uh, definitely check out our Facebook page. I'm constantly sharing things there. Um, also, we are on TikTok and all of that. Make sure you go to the website if you would like to purchase this study guide. Or remember, you can get it on Amazon. You can get all of our books on Amazon. We have, like if you look at my author page, I have all of these books, tons and tons of books on Amazon with tons and tons of five-star reviews. So make sure you have a, oops, share this tab instead. I'm on Amazon. We have tons and tons of books with tons and tons of reviews. So this is my latest book, Teach a survival guide for new educators. I really love this book. I just did a webinar on this for how to start the school year off for success. Next weekend, I'm doing a how to lesson plan. Um, so if you're a new teacher and you're like lesson planning is totally going over my head, I'm going to show you how to do it all easily. I'm even going to show you how to use chat GPT. It goes along with my book here. So I just, if you want an, a quick read, it's on Kindle unlimited for free or paperback here. So you can get that on Amazon as well. And it'll all go in the email. Let me just have a look here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Everybody's being very kind. Thank you. It's always a world of learning with Kathleen. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you spending your Saturday. This is a long webinar and you'd probably rather be sitting by the pool or whatever, but um, I appreciate you being here. Be on the lookout for that email from me with all of the extra information. I'm also going to include this presentation. If you haven't yet signed up for the webinar, you can do so on our website and you'll get the replay and all of that. I'm so glad you were here with me today. And let us know at info at KathleenJasper.com if you have any questions and it will be our pleasure to help. All right. Have a wonderful Saturday. See you guys soon. Don't forget next weekend lesson planning webinar. I'll put it in the email. Talk to you later.